To recap from the last episode, at this point in the journey, the Spanish expedition of Francisco de Oriana has come across an Operian village after almost starving to death. The Operian natives graciously aided the Spaniards with food, water, and shelter, while the Spaniards remained in this Operian village for a couple months, building their brigantine. Carvajal mentioned that they'd have so much food at some points that they had to throw some of it away. After finishing the seaworthy brigantine, the Spaniards left the village they had built it in and continued down the river path the new Operian settlements. On April 25th, 1542, the last day that the Operians spent with the uh, Spaniards, they celebrated St. Mark's Day. And here Carvajal talks about how the Spaniards started strategizing their peace with the Operians. Quote, the chief overlord came to bring us abundant food, and the captain gave him a good reception, and no ill treatment was meted out to him, because it was the purpose and desire of the captain, if it was possible, that that land and that barbaric people should continue in its friendly attitude as a consequence of our having to know them and without any dissatisfaction at all, for thereby God our Lord and the King our Master would be rendered a service, so that later on when it should please His Majesty, our sacred republic, and our Christian faith, and the banner of Castile might with greater facility be glorified in the eyes of the natives, and the country be found more tamed for pacification and for being reduced to obedience to His our master's royal service in the way most fitting because at the same time that this was being done with tact and charity the purpose was also to keep up as long as it should be necessary kind of treatment to be dealt out to the indians in order for us to be able to go forward and in order that the expedient of arms might not be resorted to save when recourse to self-defense could not be avoided Upon first reading this passage, it is clear that the Spaniards were very calculating in their approach to the Operians, saying that the reason for their friendly attitude towards the Operians was not only to avoid conflict, but also to make it easier for the land and for its people to be tamed and pacified in the future for Spain. Carvajal even calls these people barbaric after they saved the Spaniards from starving to death and continued serving them until they finished building their brigantine. Carvajal may have also written this with the thought that Charles V would be hearing this report, and that it was best to frame the report so that it would please the king. It was no mystery to any Spaniard that the overall goal of their exploration and expeditions was to eventually conquer all this new world for Spain and bring their religious beliefs along with them as they are commanded to. Oriana basically committed treason by leaving Gonzalo Pizarro for dead in the jungle. And he and his men were likely thinking in the back of their heads of ways in which they could ease their punishment or gain favor with their king. This idea will be further explored later, but for now let's continue. The expedition leaves the dominion of Operia, and after some bad directions from a native they kidnapped, they experienced another period of hunger and hardship. Carvajal says they now had to pass through, quote, more uninhabited regions than before because the river led from one wooded section to another wooded section, end quote. Another odd event in this expedition occurs when the group stops at a, quote, elevated spot which looked as if it had been inhabited and possessed some natural advantages for supplying some kind of food or at least fish. And that day was the day of St. John before the Latin Gate, which was the 6th of May. And there an incident occurred, which I should not have dared to write down if it had not been observed by so many witnesses who were present. And this was that a certain companion already mentioned, for it was the one who had directed the building of the brigantine, shot with a crossbow at a bird which was in a tree on the edge of the river. And the nut sprang out of the stock and fell into the river. And he, having no idea of ever getting the nut back, another companion named Contreras with a pole, cast a hook into the river and pulled up a fish five spans long, around 45 inches, and as it was big and the hook was small, it was necessary to extract it, the hook, 
with skill. And the fish being opened up, and in its belly the nut of the crossbow was found, and in that way the crossbow was repaired, for which there was later no little need, because next to God it was the crossbows that saved our lives." End quote. The expedition arrived in the provinces belonging to Manchiparo. Manchiparo and his overlord neighbor, Omaga, are friends who constantly war with the other overlords who are located inland. Quote, For they, the inland overlords, come each day to drive them, the Manchiparo, from their homes. This Manchiparo has his headquarters quite near the river upon a small hill and holds sway over many settlements and very large ones, which together contribute for fighting purposes 50,000 men of the age from 30 years up to 70. Because the young men do not go to war, and in all the fights that we had with them, we did not see any, but it was the old men, and these were quite expert, and they have thin mustaches and not beards. Before we had come within two leagues of this village, we saw the villages glimmering white, and we had not proceeded far when we saw coming up the river a great many canoes, all equipped for fighting, gaily colored, and the men with their shield on, which are made out of the shell-like skins of lizards, and the hides of manatees, and of tapirs, as tall as a man, because they cover them entirely. They were coming on with a great yell, playing on many drums and wooden trumpets, threatening us as if they were going to devour us. Immediately the captain gave orders to the effect that the two brigantines should join together, so that the one might aid the other, and that all should take their weapons and look to what they had before them, and take heed of the necessity on their part of defending their persons, and fighting with determination to come through to a haven of safety and that all should commend themselves to God, for he would help us in that serious plight which we were in." End quote. The native warriors came closer to the brigantines and squadrons of their canoes formed to surround the brigantines. Oriana ordered the archivuses and crossbows to fire upon the natives, but the archivuses, I think that's how you pronounce that, found their powder damp, and they were no use. And so the crossbowmen fired on the native warriors, and because of the damage they inflicted, the natives began to hold back their forces for a bit before attacking again with the massive number of reinforcements the Manchipara warriors had. Throughout this fight, Carvajal emphasizes how boldly the Manchipara attacked their brigantines. As they continued down the river in combat, they arrived at another village, which had higher embankments, with many warriors on land. The brigantines being surrounded by natives both on land and in water were so overwhelmed by arrow and spear attacks that they decided out of necessity to land on the bank and take some terrain for themselves. The crossbows were said to be the difference maker in the success of the landing, which makes the story of the nut and the fish seem like a miracle. The brigantines were beached and half of the Spaniards jumped into the water and fell upon the Indians in such a manner that they made them retreat. While half of the Spaniards began taking the beginning of the settlement, the other half stayed on the beach brigantines to defend them from the native warriors on the canoes who kept up the attack. Once part of the settlement had been won, Oriana commanded the lieutenant with 25 men to run through the settlement to drive out the rest of the retreating natives and see if there was food. The lieutenant made a foray for a distance of half a league, and throughout the village fighting with the few natives who refused to leave their homes, quote, when the aforesaid lieutenant had perceived the great extent of the settlement and its population, he decided to not go on farther, but to turn back and tell the captain what the situation was, end quote. A league was considered to be around three miles long. So the lieutenant must have traveled around 1.5 miles throughout the settlement before turning back after realizing it may be dangerous to go further. It just shows you the size of these settlements. It is likely that this distance of travel for the lieutenant is exaggerated since the group had no time to actually measure the distance because of the fight they ran. Even so, it can be understood that this settlement was quite large considering that the lieutenant traveled a large portion of the settlement 
with some parts still left unexplored after he realized the extent of it. The lieutenant returned back to Oriana and informed him that, quote, there was a great quantity of food, such as turtles and pens and pools of water, and a great deal of meat and fish and biscuit, and all this in such great abundance that there was enough to feed an expeditionary force of 1,000 men for one year, end quote. This passage also paints us a picture of not only how large the settlement was, but also how developed it had been, with zoo-like habitats for some of the animals. Oriana decided to send Cristobal Maldonado de Sogovia, along with 12 other companions, to collect all the food they could. When Maldonado gathered more than a thousand turtles, the natives returned with a great number of men determined to take the settlement back. It is not stated if Carvajal witnessed this event or not, but according to him, Maldonado's position was surrounded by a likely overestimated 2,000 natives against Maldonado and the now 10 men who were with him. According to the account, because of the superior skills of the Spaniards in combat, they were able to hold off a large number of natives. However, six companions were seriously wounded, some being pierced through the arms and legs. Maldonado was pierced in one of his arms and given a blow to the face with a stick. Despite all of this, it was said that Maldonado rallied the few of his companions who could fight and fought so courageously that he was the means of preventing the natives from breaking through their defense and killing everyone in this expedition. While this was happening, the rest of the Spaniards along with Oriana were ambushed while resting in some of the settlement houses without their armor on. The natives had come around by the upper part of the village from two sides, and when they were noticed, they were already among the Spaniards and had felled four in the ambush, leaving them very badly wounded. The natives surrounded the houses where the companions were, and another squadron of more than 500 natives were in the settlement square. Some of the companions along with Oriana attacked the squadron. The natives were routed, but not after wounding nine companions with grievous wounds, and at the end of two hours of fighting, the natives were vanquished and routed with the companions of the expedition greatly fatigued and injured. An interesting side note to this battle, Carvajal speaks of many companions who distinguished themselves who, quote, until now, had not been aware of what they were good for, nor had we held them in any esteem, end quote. Blas de Medina was one of these men singled out for his bravery, who, with nothing but a dagger and his thigh pierced through, rushed in among the foes and fought so well that the entire group was astonished. After this, Oriana came down the road of the settlement to meet Maldonado, who was injured along with the rest of his men. One of his men, Pedro de Ampudia, eight days later, died of his wounds. The group came back to the beginning of the settlement close to the river and began treating the wounded of whom there were 18. After this battle, the natives were regrouping their forces in a gully outside of the settlement. Oriana ordered a cavalier named Cristobal Enriquez to go there and drive them out with 15 men. Cristobal Enriquez was unable to drive out the natives and retreated back to the brigantine. Oriana states that he wanted to conquer this land eventually, but not at this moment. The group loaded the wounded into the brigantines and sailed away just moments before a group of 400 natives came from the river and land to attack them again. Because of the arquebuses and crossbows, the expedition was able to defend themselves as they sailed further down the river. However, the natives followed brigantines, attacking them constantly, not allowing them a moment of respite. The natives followed them down the river, attacking in this manner from sundown to sunrise, on this new day, the expedition found themselves in the midst of many large settlements where fresh natives were constantly coming out while the ones who were fatigued dropped out. At about midday, the companions of the expedition were no longer able to row and were thoroughly exhausted. Quote, from these settlements, there appeared many Indians, more than 130 canoes in which there were more than 8,000 Indians. And on the land, the men who appeared were beyond count. There went among these men and the war canoes four or five sorcerers, all daubed 
with whitewash and with their mouths full of ashes, which they blew into the air, having in their hands a pair of aspergills, with which, as they moved along, they kept throwing water about the river as a form of enchantment. And after they had made one complete turn about our brigantines, in this manner in which I have said, they called out to the warriors, and at once these began to blow their wooden bugles and trumpets and beat their drums, and with a very loud yell they attacked us. But, as I have already said, the arquebuses and crossbows next to God were our salvation. End quote. The native warriors had set up an ambush from all sides of the river with canoes in the center. The captain general of the Machiparo warriors stood out before them, distinguishing himself in a very manly fashion. A companion of the expedition, Celius, took aim and fired with an arquebus, and he hit the leader in the middle of the chest and killed him. Immediately after his death, the rest of the native warriors became disheartened as they gathered around to look at their dead leader. The Spaniards seized the opportunity to get away into the wide part of the river and escape. The warriors of Machiparo still followed the expedition for two days and two nights without letting them rest until they finally got out of the territory of Machiparo, which, in the opinion of the Spaniards, extended for more than 80 leagues. According to the expedition, this entire area was inhabited with large villages. Quote, for there was not from village to village in most cases a crossbow shot, and the one which was farthest removed from the next was not half a league away, and there was one settlement that stretched for five leagues without there intervening any space from house to house, which was a marvelous thing to behold, as we were only passing by and fleeing, we had no opportunity to learn what there was in the country farther inland, but judged from its apparent wealth of natural resources and its general appearance, it must be the most populous that has been seen. And this was just what the Indians of the province of Aparia had told us that it was, saying that there was a very great overlord in the interior towards the south, whose name was Ika and that this latter possessed very great wealth in gold and silver, and this piece of information we considered to be very reliable and exact." End quote. The expedition had now left the area ruled by Machipar and now entered the territory ruled by Onaguayo, or Omaguchi, and at the entrance to this land stood a village on the model of a garrison, not very large and on an elevated spot overlooking the river with many warriors. Since the expedition had been fighting for so long and as a result suffered from hunger, Oriana decided to take over the fortress. The Spaniards went with their usual strategy of firing upon the natives with their crossbows and arquebuses, beaching the brigantines and jumping out and fighting the natives on land. Once the natives retreated, the expedition set up a camp at the fortress and stayed there for three days while defending themselves from some native counterattacks. While staying in this fortified position, the men noticed that, quote, there were many roads here that entered into the interior of the land very fine highways, for which reason the captain was wary and commanded us to get ready, because he did not wish to stay there any longer, for it might come about that from our staying there some harm would result." End quote. After the expedition left this fort, they continued down the river to find many other large settlements at the Trinity River, which they named because of three islands where the river emptied. They were now in the dominion of Omaga, where the land was very pretty and very fruitful, with so many villages and people that Oriana did not want to make port. The natives of this land occasionally attacked the brigantines and tried speaking with the Spaniards, but they could not understand their language. At one point, the expedition came to a village on a high bank that appeared small enough to capture, and so they did. The village seemed to be a recreation spot of some overlord from the inland, and after an hour of fighting with the natives, they were able to take it over. Quote, in this village, there was a villa in which there was a great deal of porcelain ware of various makes, both jars and pitchers, very large, with a capacity of more than 25 arabas, 100 gallons, and other small pieces such as plates and bowls and candelabra of this porcelain, 
of the best that has ever been seen in the world. For that of Malaga is not its equal, because it, this porcelain which we found, is all glazed and embellished with all colors, and so bright are these colors that they astonish, and more than this, the drawings and paintings which they make on them are so accurately worked that one wonders how with only natural skill they manufacture and decorate all these things, making them look just like Roman articles. And here the Indians told us that as much as there was made out of clay in this house, so much there was back in the country in gold and silver. And they said that they would take us there, for it was near. And in this house there were two idols woven out of feathers of divers sorts, which frightened one. And they were of the stature of giants. And on their arms stuck into the fleshy part, they also had a pair of discs resembling candlesticks sockets. And they also had the same thing on their calves close to the knees. Their ears were bored through and very large like those of the Indians of Cusco and even larger. This race of people resides in the, the interior of the country and is the one which possesses the riches already mentioned. And it is as reminders that they have the, the two idols there. And in this village also there were gold and silver. But as our intention was merely to search for something to eat and see to it that we saved our lives and gave an account of such a great accomplishment, we did not concern ourselves with, nor were we interested in any wealth. End quote. Quote, From this village there went out many roads and fine highways they were to the inland country. Captain wished to find out where they led to, and for this purpose he took with him Cristobal Maldonado and the lieutenant and some other companions and started to follow them, the roads. And he had not gone half a league when the roads became more like royal highways and wider. And when the captain had perceived this, he decided to turn back because he saw that it was not prudent to go on any farther. End quote. After this strange discovery, the expedition continues sailing down the river, encountering many other villages going from what they describe as small villages, medium-sized villages, large villages, and very large villages. In the region ruled by Paguana, which is the next region they entered after leaving the Omaga, they encountered villages that are reported to be over two leagues long. In this village, the natives were friendly and even gave the Spaniards presents and let them into their homes. In one day, they passed more than 20 villages in the Paguana region, with some of these villages also extending for two and a half leagues. The expedition reached the end of the province of Paguana and entered into a province more warlike. The expedition did not learn the name of the overlord of this land, but they said this area was populated by people of medium stature who were very highly developed in manners and customs, with shields made of wood. While in this area, the group came across the Rio Negro, calling it that because of how ink black the river was and how it contrasted against the rest of the other rivers. The expedition eventually comes to a medium sized village with friendly inhabitants that came right up to them. In this village, there was a very large public square, and in the center of the square was a hewn tree trunk, ten feet in girth. A walled city with its gate and two towers is carved into the tree trunk. Please like and subscribe on this video and comment if you have any more things you want me to talk about in the future on the next video. Thank you for watching part two of this three-part series. Part three will be released sometime this summer of 2023. I haven't been working on it super fast because number one, I have a job and number two, I have other projects that I'm working on. So I'm taking some time off here and there to work on these videos, which is why they take so long for me to produce. But this third one shouldn't take as long as the second one has. I was originally planning on releasing this second one and third one in the same big video, but it was gonna be an hour long video and I already had this half done, so I thought I might as well just post it and then finish the other half and post it soon. And also, I think it's nicer to have 
three separate videos because people don't have like an hour to watch all this stuff. I realize that. So thank you for watching and God bless.